Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session on our overview of GIS in the health sciences. My name is Orby Dingwall. Do you want to bring Christine? Oh, I keep, keep going. going. Keep going. Oh. <laughs> it's crowded in here. Hi, I'm Christine Nielsen. <laughs> and this is Grace Romand, and she joins us today from the University of Manitoba Science Library, where she is an assistant librarian. And Grace used to be with us here in the health sciences, so knows all about the health sciences. And we were so excited to have her join us today to sort of mesh those two worlds of GIS that she now does, uh, or which is part of her portfolio uh, in the sciences, and with her experience of what she knows about what you, healthcare professionals, uh, might need to know about maps and all kinds of exciting things. So with that, we're going to turn it straight over to Grace. Uh, take it away. Perfect. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending today's session. Um, as Orby mentioned, and I'll just add to it a tiny bit, um, my role in the science library is I provide services to those working in environment, earth, and resources, um, which can also be defined as um, geography and environmental sciences. So um, that's kind of the lens through which I work with um, these types of resources uh, pretty frequently. Um, so uh, today, uh, uh, what I would hope we will be able to accomplish is um, to identify some uses for GIS software programs within uh, health sciences disciplines, um, that you will be able to list some different types of geospatial data, which can be viewed and analyzed using GIS technologies. And then we're going to compare some different GIS software programs, um, you know, for you to get an idea of what options are out there um, to uh, think about using or exploring and, and um, playing with a little bit. So to get there first, I'm going to define GIS, what is it, um, and then also discuss uh, the different data types and their specific uses. I'm going to review the different GIS software programs, their strengths and weaknesses, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what you need to do with your own data or if you're thinking about um, different data sources or different data within the health sciences that you might want to use um, and view and analyze within GIS software programs. Um, and I'll note as well that this is an overview session. Um, so it's at a pretty introductory basic overview level. Um, and for more information, um, there's a number of resources I will mention at the end and we can talk um, beyond this webinar as well if you have um, more questions of, uh, about more detailed information. And Grace, just a housekeeping thing, um, before we go further, if they have questions, do you want them to ask them as we go, or would you like them to wait until the end? Yeah, you're welcome to uh, ask questions as we go. Um, I can see the chat window, so um, if it's something that kind of fits in with where I'm uh, presenting on at the moment, then I can address it right at then. If it's something that maybe um, I'm going to address a little bit later, I might hold on to it and wait. So if I don't answer right away, I, I will answer at the end. Um, but feel free to, as you remember your questions, to throw them into the chat so you don't forget. Um, so uh, as you can see here up on the screen, um, uh, there's a little slide introducing uh, geographic information systems. Uh, that is the term uh, what GIS is, um, and a geographic information system can be used to either display or analyze geospatial data. So to display it would mean just to kind of represent some information that you've gathered about uh, the geography of an area as it relates to health um, to be able to show to your colleagues or to uh, patients or consumers or whoever. Um, and you can also, within those systems, analyze the data. So you can pull um, uh, information out of that data using GIS tools 
um, that tells you something about perhaps the distance between points on a map or um, information that you can get out of it through analysis that you don't have going into uh, putting the information into uh, the software program. Up here on the screen is a little um, visualization that I created of the Manitoba Health Authorities um, and the different colors denote different uh, health authorities. And I, I created that using ArcGIS and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, before I get there, though, I, I wanted to introduce the topic of spatial thinking, uh, also defined as spatial reasoning. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because um, to kind of give us more of an idea of the different questions that you can ask and answer through use, using maps and looking at maps. Um, so spatial thinking or spatial reasoning is to perceive, organize, or remember spatial information. Um, and to do that, you can um, ask all sorts of questions. Um, and I've listed some of them here. So these uh, concepts are taken from um, some resources that uh, were given to me by the Michigan Geographic Alliance uh, in association with uh, Central Michigan University. I saw them presented at a conference and we had some great conversations about spatial thinking. Um, so the map uh, you're seeing on the screen, it just shows uh, countries with legally binding controls on lead paint. Uh, so the blue uh, countries are countries that have legally binding controls on the use of lead paint, and the orange are the ones that don't, and then um, the, other, uh, the white is where they don't have data. <laughs> so, um, hopefully I can um, illustrate these concepts kind of using this map. So, the first one is spatial comparison. So, how does one place or region um, compare to another? So, for example, how does one of the blue countries on this map compare to one of the, uh, one of the orange or yellowy ones? Um, that's a spatial comparison. Uh, spatial influence. So. How does one place influence another? For example, how does a coal mine in an area and the fumes that it emits influence the health of those in the surrounding areas? Um, another spatial reasoning concept is regions. So how do we subdivide areas? So I showed you in the couple of slides before, um, health authorities is one way, um, Arctic, subarctic, different um, geographical regions in that way. Spatial patterns. Um, so these are patterns that we can see spatially, so migration patterns, for example. Um, spatial associations, so uh, how does a phenomena in one area influence that place? So for example, how does a federal policy on uh, the use of lead paint influence the health of those in that place? Um, uh, spatial hierarchies, I'm going to show you a map a little bit later on. Um, that shows uh, all the different rural healthcare facilities in Manitoba. Um, you know, uh, uh, what's the difference between a nursing station versus a hospital in a large center? Um, those kind of geographic distinctions. Um, spatial analogies, so how something occurring in one area um, can be analogous to something happening in another area. Um, you know, an outbreak. Uh, a flu outbreak in, in one PCH, how is that is similar or different? So there's an analogy to an outbreak in another PCH. Um, and then sequences and transitions. How do the conditions of a region change as you travel from one place to another? And how does those transitions, and for example, potable water in an area, and then you travel a little distance, and then there is no potable water in that area, and how do those transitions affect? the people in the area. So those are some different uh, questions and things that you can be thinking about and questions that you can answer using maps. Um, um, and so, yeah, this is the backdrop um, of all that is to come. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is data types. So there are two main data types that can be used within GIS systems. The first one is vector data. and um, 
I apologize for my slightly ugly map of Winnipeg, but it illustrates my point, um, which I will explain in a moment. Um, and so uh, it serves its purpose, despite the fact that it's not uh, particularly pretty. Okay, so vector data is the data that I use most frequently, and you probably have seen visualized um, in maps in healthcare, um, in my experience. Um, so that's the first one, vector data. It, I don't have a great reason as to, um, or a great way for you to remember why it's called vector data, but you just kind of have to remember that. Um, so there's three different data types within vector data. The first one is polygons. Uh, so that would be a shape, something that has an area. So I don't know if you can, can they see this? Can, can I, you see my mouse on the screen? We believe that they can. Okay. So <laughs> uh, oh, we have a hand raise. I'll under attend. It's okay. Mm. Okay. So hopefully you can see there's so there's shapes uh, on this map and each one denotes you can see um, in really small it, it shows the different postal code areas um, and what the postal code is for that area within Winnipeg. Um, so each one of those is a shape. It has sides to it and it has an area that's considered a polygon. The next one is lines, sometimes called a polyline. Um, they, they mean the same thing. Uh, you can use the terms interchangeably. Um, although if you want to start splitting hairs, uh, polylines could suggest that it has multiple segments that go in different directions and a line just is one segment of a line. But in any case, um, the lines that you can see on this map are actually uh, the major roads within Winnipeg. And so it doesn't necessarily give you the area information of it, um, but it tells you where it is and the line that it follows. And then the last one is points. And you can see on this map, the points are these little green triangles. And the green triangles denote uh, fitness recreation centers uh, within um, within Winnipeg, within the uh, the downtown area, or and thereabouts. Um, and uh, so those are the three different types. You have the polygons, which are shapes, the polylines or lines, um, which show you a line, and then the points give you individual information about one point on a map. And we just thank you to the uh, participant who confirmed that they can see your mouse. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, okay, now to the next data type. I won't spend too much time on it, but just to describe uh, that there is a second data type that you may hear being discussed. For example, if you are working uh, with GIS technologists who are generating maps for you, then you at least kind of have the terminology um, that is used uh, when discussing this type of data and these software programs. This one is raster data. So raster data differs um, from vector data in that instead of giving you um, features on a map that has a list of attributes, um, that can, you know, a, a polygon can have any type of shape and or a line could denote a river that's a certain length. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, and that's displayed geographically. Raster data um, is split up on a grid. So as you can see on here, there's a grid and then each one of these, um, each one of these cells is assigned a value and a piece of information. So each one is a unique piece of information. So it gives you very detailed geographic information um, on a grid. But I wouldn't think too hard about it because um, for your purposes within health sciences, you're probably going to be focusing more on uh, vector data. But now you know there's two. There's vector data and there's raster data. And that's what there is. So now I'm going to show you a few different examples of some maps that I have found um, online, uh, freely available, that kind of give you an idea of how um, you can display health-related geographic information. So the first one is from WHO. It is um, immuniz immunization coverage with DTP3 vaccines in infants from 2017, and it actually was updated in July of 2018. Um, 
And this is just a very simple geographic um, visualization of uh, vaccine coverage in the world. Um, I will note here um, a little bit about the use um, and importance of what colors you use in a map. Um, so in this map, you can see that blue means high vaccine coverage down to red, meaning no vaccine coverage um, or less than 50%. Um, so that kind of has a value statement in there as well about, you know, uh, blue meaning good and red kind of we're conditioned to think that that is bad or like often you'll see um, red to green color ramps. Um, and uh, just in um, health sciences research, just how when you're conducting research, you can introduce um, biases into your research um, through a manner of ways when you're creating um, uh, geospatial visualiza visualizations of um, health sciences information, um, you can also um, kind of enter in some biases depending on what colors you use uh, to represent different information. For example, maybe a little bit less harsh um, value statement in this map could be something like um, a dark blue to light blue as opposed to going to red, um, for example. Here's another one. Um, uh, this is taken from uh, Health Canada. Uh, it's a Lyme disease risk areas map, um, and it shows you the different areas in Canada um, where um, uh, Borealia burgdorferi are known <laughs> to occur most likely. Um, and this is a map from 2016 information. Um, and you can see here the legend that says risk areas are denoted with this pattern. And then it shows the pattern and gives you um, uh, secondary frames to kind of enlarge the information there of the different areas. Um, and I've got another one for you here, and I told you I was going to show you this. Um, don't worry about looking too closely at uh, the information, um, uh, the textual information on the slide, but I have it there if you want to take a look. This is taken from ArcGIS Online, um, where uh, the government of Manitoba has an account and has generated a number of maps, some of which are health related. Um, and this map shows you the rural health care facilities in Manitoba. Um, and I, I've included the, um, the field information of all of the different uh, information points that are, are features that are attributed to each one of the points on the map. Um, however, there was more than could fit in this slide, so and more at the bottom. But um, another way that you could um, geographically um, view information. And I recommend, too, if you're curious about um, some different health information um, data sets online, to take a look at that um, Manitoba government uh, account, because they have a number of maps available up there. OK. So those are some different examples of um, health information displayed geographically. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the different software programs that you can use to create those visualizations. Um, so the first one is ArcGIS. Um, I start here because it's the largest um, and it's the biggest player in the game of, of GIS systems. Um, I, I always liken it to like the Apple um, product. Um, and similar to the way that Microsoft Office has a suite of resources um, that includes, you know, Word and Excel and Publisher. ArcGIS is the same way. It has a number of tools within the toolbox um, which uh, can be used to do different things. The main tool for 2D mapping is ArcMap. Um, the Manitoba Health Authority's um, visualization and, in fact, the ugly one of Winnipeg that I showed you earlier. Um, I created both of those using ArcMap. 
Um, and then there's some others as well. So our catalog, it, it is the product that manages um, the connections between different GIS files. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, file types in a moment. Um, but just to say that if you tried to open up, if, if some colleague of yours sent you some uh, GIS data and you had no GIS software program on your computer and you just tried to open up the files within Windows Explorer, it would just look like a series of files that uh, didn't give you any particular useful information or wouldn't be able to open anything. You need this product, our catalog, or some um, analogous product to be able to open up the data files. Um, and then there's another couple, ArcScene and ArcGlobe. Um, these are for 3D mapping. Um, a little more about ArcGIS. Uh, you may hear if you are exploring the world of GIS the term Esri. Esri is the company um, that creates the ArcGIS product. Um, it's pretty costly. Um, uh, it's about $500 a year per individual license uh, for one workstation. Um, it's pretty complex uh, software with a big learning curve, um, but its functionality kind of um, outpaces most, um, if not any, um, uh, competition. Um, so if you're wanting to really get into using it, this is the product that is heavily used by GIS, technolog GIS technologists. It only works on PCs. If you're a big Mac user, um, then this isn't the product for you. It will not work on a Mac. Um, and it also has an online application, ArcGIS Online, which has um, some functionality, um, but everything that you create within ArcGIS Online platform um, is freely available to view by anybody. Um, so it's not, and it, it lives up on the cloud. So um, for sensitive data, it's not necessarily a great option. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is QGIS. Um, if um, um, so, I always say that QGIS is kind of like the Linux of um, of GIS software programs. If you're familiar with um, computer operating software, um, because it's open source, you can freely download it. Um, from their website, there is a Mac version available, and very conveniently, it uses the same file um, and data types as ArcGIS. So um, you can have QGIS, um, you could download QGIS onto your workstation this afternoon um, free of charge, and you could open up files sent to you by a colleague who is um, using. Um, uh, ArcGIS. They would have to be the the building block files, not um, not the map documents, but um, still uh, definitely a great option for those that uh, kind of want to explore GIS but don't necessarily want to commit to a large outlay of money. Um, and I say too, like if you're looking from across a computer lab and you can see two screens side by side uh, at a distance. Um, and one of them has ArcGIS open or ArcMap and the other one has QGIS. You can't really tell the difference from afar which one is which. Um, they're fairly similar in terms of their use. Um, the one difference is, is that um, ArcMap and ArcGIS Suite, when you download it onto your computer, it's one big large software program that takes up lots of space and uh, I had to download extra um, or I had to install extra RAM and and uh, a better graphics card on my computer to make it work optimally. Um, but um, you have everything you could possibly need. Whereas QGIS, um, you download kind of the bare bones software program to help you display the uh, data. And then to do extra functional things, you download plugins as you need them, kind of like downloading a, a web browser extension or something. Um, so slightly two different ways of um, 
of using software. The last one I'm going to mention um, is Google Earth Pro. It's free to download. Uh, there is a Mac version available. The um, complicating factor for, there's two of them, uh, for using Google Earth Pro is it has different file formats um, than ArcGIS or QGIS, uh, the different data files. That they're called KML and KMZ files. Um, so many open data portals now um, where you can download open data, and I'm going to show you some of those sources in a couple of minutes, um, have KML and KMZ files, like in the city of Winnipeg, uh, the city of Winnipeg's open data portal, you can download um, these file types now. Um, uh, but it's just something different. So it, it's not great if you're working with someone else who's using other software, if they won't talk to each other. Um, and um, and the other thing is is that when you create uh, to to share a map created in Google Earth Pro, um, you have to again upload it to the cloud. So you wouldn't ever want to upload um, sensitive um, information. Um, so a consideration within the health environment, um, and it integrates really well with Google Spreadsheets or Google Sheets, um, which is great if you use uh, Google products a lot. Um, okay, so those are the different software programs and some of their strengths and weaknesses. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where to start and what to start thinking about if you want to maybe create some maps or think about using GIS software within your own um, within your own uh, work. So to prepare your data, um, uh, you need to use Excel tables. So um, oftentimes researchers use um, Excel or, or collect their data in a tabular format. Um, so that's great. The only thing um, that I will say is that you have to make sure that your data is clean. And I, I mean, if you're using any statistical analysis software, um, that kind of is always the case, and it's the same for GIS as well. Um, but making sure that within your columns of data, um, it, it's very precise information. So you don't put any notes within the columns that, um, or within the fields that has your data points. You can have a separate column that has your notes, but make sure that it's unique uh, data points within each one of the fields. Um, and the other thing is that you do need to collect some sort of geographic data point, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a latitude or a longitude. Um, it could be a census division. It could be a postal code division. Um, it could be a region, so what um, health authority is someone in, or what town are they from, or, um, you know, any sort of uh, geographic data point. Um, but you don't necessarily have to be, you know, out with a remote, um, a GPS tracker doing latitude and longitude remote sensing um, tracking to be able to uh, do visualizations using GIS. You just need to collect some sort of um, geographic data, and that could be con um, conceptualized very broadly. Um, so the next thing I'm going to show you is some open data sources. Um, I'll say here that I have included pretty much all of these in um, the workbook that I provided uh, for the session that you received earlier, um, but they're here for you as well. These are places where you can, and examples of places, I have the Winnipeg one um, as the first point, but I recognize that many of you are not in Winnipeg, but just to, to or most of you, um, but this is just to express that um, most municipal, especially if they're a little bit larger, but um, I would check even for smaller places. Most municipal governments have some form of um, 
geospatial data collecting um, mechanism, so um, they often will make that data available. Um, so I would recommend you check um, for your own area if you're curious about what kind of data is available through your municipal governments. Um, and then the Manitoba Land Initiative, this has a lot of environmental data. Um, and then the one that I included, uh, the second from the bottom is surveys and statistical programs from Statistics Canada. This has a lot of the health survey data. Um, all of this data is tabular data, which uh, you can then attach to um, files that have the geospatial information. So for example, um, from open government or, or from open data portal, you could download the files that have the outline of an area. And then from Surveys and Statistics Canada, um, you could uh, download tabular data uh, relating to uh, age demographics within that region. And then uh, using the information on page four, page three of the workbook that I um, sent out in advance, uh, it has the information about how you um, mesh those two things together to create a map. Um, and if you have any questions about how to do that as well, uh, we can have a conversation as well. Um, so I think that's, I'm coming to the end of uh, what I had to say already. If you have um, any questions, I'm very happy uh, to take any questions. Um, and yeah, there's my contact information. And um, good. And I think I'll just make a comment. Grace had referenced uh, about a workbook that we'd sent around. Um, some of you registered after we sent that workbook, so uh, after the session, we'll make sure that everybody has a copy of that. And we're also recording today's session, so if you wanted to check back on something or if you think that you've got colleagues who would be interested, the recording will be posted. Mm -hmm. um, so that is available. Yeah. yeah. Um, were there any questions? Um, I, I didn't see any questions throughout the presentation, but I can, I'm going to stick around for a couple minutes just to see if you are formulating um, any questions. Um, and my email address is there as well, so I'm very happy. I know that sometimes um, it can be hard to think about, sometimes the examples can really help to think about how you might want to um, uh, incorporate um, cartography, mapping into um, your own um, research or practice. Um, the one thing for sure is that geographic data points, think very broadly, as long as there's some sort of geography uh, collected in data you're collecting, if you're um, trying to collect information, um, that can somehow be put on a map most times. So I have a question, mm -hmm. because sometimes when I've been doing a presentation, I've wanted to include mm -hmm. a little map, mm -hmm. and I then usually talked myself out of it because creating it was going to be <laughs> too complicated. So on a scale, like how, if I just want to create a map for a presentation that I'm giving, and I want to be able to do it myself, what's, what's the learning curve and the time commitment? that I would need to do that ballpark? Mm, I would say if, you're, if your purpose is to create um, maps for presentations or you're going to throw it into a, a publication or something, um, and your purpose is mainly to display data as opposed to we were talking about you can either display or analyze. Um, that um, there's a product, uh, it's a plugin for um, Microsoft Excel. So most of us know how to use Excel. Um, and you can download the plugin um, freely from uh, the ArcGIS online website. You create a little account, and then um, it has, it kind of works like uh, how you would use any kind of Excel, Excel um, functionality. So it doesn't take too much to figure out how to learn how to use it. Um, and you can 
Um, as long as you have a table that has some geographic information um, in it and it's organized as I suggested, like that all of your columns have unique information in them and it, you don't have extra kind of noise within your fields. Um, which I think is the, it's not a learning curve, it's just the most labor intensive part. So if you know in advance before collecting information or, you know, putting something that you want to turn into a map, if you know in advance that that's what you want to do with it, then you create it from the beginning with that in mind as opposed to having to go backwards and um so yeah i don't i would say probably an afternoon okay like, so you know, you're in the realm around, of yeah. fighting making a, some kind of chart or output from excel yeah the normal amount of yes yeah. time and yeah. energy that i usually expend yeah. into that thing so instead yeah. of making like a pie chart yeah. or a Graph it creates thing, a map. I could do a map with an Excel plugin. So that would yeah. just be pretty easy to yeah. just do like a quick, I did a survey, here's where my participants were from. Exactly. And that plugin also um, integrates really well into PowerPoint. So if you're someone who uses um, PowerPoint slides um, for your presentations, the integration is really nice. I yeah. am so glad I asked. This was not staged at all. That was legit my question. <laughs> okay, Christine um, has sorry. a question. I just have a follow-up. I just I can't quite get you have to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a follow-up question. So you said it's a ArcGIS plugin. So does that mean that it, it your information is stored out in the world and people can see it? That is correct. Okay. Just double yeah. checking. <sighs> yeah. Way to uh, way to bring way down to the privacy room. manage that. <laughs> yeah. So this is the this is the trick about um, GIS software programs is like all things in health. Um, if you're dealing with sensitive information, you have to do the homework to make sure that whatever product you're using um, has the functionality to be able to privacy protect. Um, and similarly to any software program, basically how you do that is um, uh, making sure that you download local software that lives on one device um, and then you create files that then you save on that one device, um, as opposed to like there, there are a number of software programs, especially if you want to share the information, then you have to share and upload for it to be saved. Um, and then you have no control over where it lives or who sees it or, um, and, um, but there are lots of options to not do that. Um, and I'll notice while I had a question, a similar question, um, from someone in a previous similar session uh, about products to um, that can be used to collect um, geospatial information out in the field. So, for example, if you're uh, doing interviews um, with your participants out in various locations and you want to um, collect latitude and longitude information while you're out there so that you can have that as a part of your data set. Um, there are tools to do that, like um, uh, GPS devices that collect that information while you're out there. Um, I haven't covered those in this session. Those are a whole different set of tools, um, but the majority of those tools that you can use can then, um, the information from those can be uploaded into um, the, the software programs that I mentioned in today's session. And um, these are kind of more the end product creation tools as opposed to the tools that you would use to collect geospatial data. That's a whole different set of things. That mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. Okay. Maybe we'll just do one last call for questions. Yeah. Uh, so you can just type those into the question or chat box. Uh, and we are, uh, Christine and I are always available for questions afterwards. And Grace is willing to field questions uh, as well. So you've got her contact info there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, we've got a hand, Grace, if you can just click on that. Mm -hmm. Or where did it go? Um, Go back to question. Oh, here we go. There we go. So the hand is up, but um, if you have a question, if you could type it into the chat. Oh, good questions. Oh, questions. 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 Uh huh. 
I don't see anything. Well, uh, we will stick around for a few more minutes, um, but otherwise we are finished for today. So we'll be sending out again, uh, for those that haven't already received the workbook, we'll be sending that out. Yeah. And we want to thank Grace so much for coming and being our thank first you. guest Ooh, speaker. I I the first mm -hmm. <laughs> we sincerely appreciate this. We learned a lot and I'm sure that um, the participants today learned a lot too. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, it it is a little bit of a learning curve at the beginning to learn um, these tools, but um, uh, it can be learned and used by anybody. And I highly recommend, um, you know, kind of um, getting exploring uh, in the workbook as well. I provided a couple of links to some additional sources of. Um, uh, training tools and that kind of thing that you can find freely online if you want. Um, this is kind of more of the overview to introduce you to the realm. Um, but if you're curious about like where to click and what to do within different software programs, I've provided all of those links uh, in the workbook um, under additional uh, resources and troubleshooting and tools. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. <laughs>